Good morning. Happy Friday to you. Displaying my Ridgecrest pride with my Ridgecrest t-shirt today, as I usually do on Friday. Let's jump right into screen sharing. Last day of the first quarter, day 44, Friday, October 23rd, by whom room has PE today. Uh, remember on Tuesday, there's no school for you guys on Monday. I'll be here actually setting up my room for the people that are gonna be coming in. And on Tuesday, there's gonna be 23 people online in a homeroom and there will be eight here at school. It's all gonna be okay. We'll continue reading Election, A Kid's Guide to Picking Our President by Dan Gutman. I really am enjoying reading this book. It's so well written. I would recommend it for anybody. In your small groups today, Brain Pop and Clever, there's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten videos. And try to make it through all of them. You've had time over the last uh, three days now. And then the games also. Write a two sentence summary for the game and video that you watched today, one of them. I hope somebody else recites the preamble. Really love listening to you. We will also be reciting the rest of the amendments. Not by memory, I'll pull it up on the screen so everybody can see it as you read it. Don't forget that sustained self-directed reading. Nothing improves your brain, your vocabulary building, your recognizing quality writing and sentences than reading good quality books and then continuing to grow into ever more complex books and it makes your brain smarter and smarter and you don't even really always realize it, just what it does for you and your language development. But I hope you can trust me on that. But reading, reading, reading is the key for education and for learning. Of course, there are lots of other types of learning. There really are, but in terms of academic learning, um, reading is very important. And then by reading a lot, you actually become a better writer because your mind starts recognizing sentences that make sense in well-written sentences. Speaking of writing, you have a first quarter reflection to do, due Tuesday, October 27th uh, at the end of the day. If you are coming in to uh, the classroom, you can just bring it to me, uh, print it out or write it out. Uh, or you can upload it um, before Tuesday. I don't know if you'll have access after that though, if you're coming into the building. So remember, this is not a research project. It's just from your own reflection, your own mind, your own experience, your own memory of what you did well, what your experience was like, what you wanna do more of, less of with your online learning. And if you are coming back, you can talk about that. You've got these words to practice. Example, experience, fatal, flexible, furious, gathered, gist, infer, intelligent, and invitation. Please use these websites for the definitions and the other one for spelling practice. Today, you'll have another tutoring video on the dash and hyphen, uh, as well as the slash. See the slash there? And then uh, in your small groups, you can play capitalization and punctuation Jeopardy. This will be your last day in, this, in these small groups because uh, when I divide you up on Tuesday, uh, it'll be groups of four or five or six in your small teams groups. And again, we do rotate those. So if you get with people that might not be your favorite people to be in a group with, do know it's always temporary, a week, two weeks. And then we mix you up again. We'll put you in the blender. And then out comes a new group of kids. We won't really put you in a blender. 
It's molted third graders. It's a third grader shake. I hope somebody makes napkin rings since we did editing this week on expository writing on how to make napkin rings. That would be so cool. Continuing our election process, your last day to compete or show your skills with the geography games. Now, again, these aren't going away. You can go play these anytime you want. However, uh, we won't be spending time during online sessions to compete or have you show what you know. We'll be doing other things with geography, dipping back into Google Maps and Google Earth, and spanning the globe globe in search of geography knowledge. The answer to yesterday immediately fills a room. It's light. Open the door, turn the light on, boom, fills it up. And it's a mirror. If you drop it, it's going to crack usually. If you smile at it, it smiles right back at you. And this was the hard one. The word is aisle, I-S-L-E. And when you put a <clears throat> an A at the beginning of it, it still is pronounced aisle. Aisle here would be a type of island or an island chain. And this is the space between rows, the aisle. Like what aisle am I in for the movie theater? Remember those? The movie theater. Hmm. Can't wait to go back there and see. I can't wait to see my first movie post-COVID. We're really looking forward to that in the movie theater. Uh, you watch movies at home, but I still get a big thrill. At my, even at my age, almost 60 in January, I still get a thrill of getting my big bag of popcorn and my candy. Sometimes I put the milk duds in the popcorn and swirl it around, and the caramel and the chocolate melts. You know, you know the drill. It's fun, and then your movie comes on. There's so many fun facts about YouTube that... I just couldn't pick one. There's a whole list. So I gave you a website to visit and it feels like YouTube's been around forever. And for you guys, it has been, you know, you're eight and nine. It started in 2005, 15 years ago, the year I moved to Florida. And by the next year of me being in Florida, I already had a YouTube channel and I was already uploading videos. So I was a YouTuber from the beginning. Not a very popular one. You won't find me getting any money for uh, my 10,000 subscribers. So look at those fun facts. Remember, your book is at the bottom. Uh, Dan Gutman, Election, A Kid's Guide to Picking Our President. Let's jump right into that book. Wonderfully written book. I love wonderfully written book. There are some books that are quite popular, and sometimes they're even battle of the books books. And to me, mm, yeah, they're not all that well written to me. So I love well written books, nonfiction and fiction. Let's jump in and finish up chapter one. So every president that has ever been president, and since there's only been men, they're, they've been married, so they have a wife, and they're called the first lady, the first lady of the country. Even though the president's spouse has no stated responsibility and receives no pay, it is also a very difficult job. We don't have royalty in the United States, but the wives of our presidents are close to royalty. Their every word, action, and hairstyle are noticed and criticized. From the beginning, first ladies have realized that they had influence. They each found a way to use that influence, being careful not to appear too powerful as they are not elected by the people. I am in a position where I can do the most good to help the most people, Eleanor Roosevelt said. She traveled the world, held press conferences, gave lectures, spoke on the radio, and wrote newspaper columns fighting for human justice and rights for all Americans. That set the tone for the modern first lady devoted to social causes. Lady Bird Johnson campaigned to make the highways of America more beautiful. Betty Ford fought for women's rights and founded a famous center for alcohol and drug rehabilitation. Rosalind Carter worked for mental health reform. Nancy Reagan led the war on drugs. Barbara Bush and Laura Bush promoted literacy. Hillary Rodham Clinton campaigned to improve the nation's health care system. By the way, before she ran for president, she was the wife of one of our presidents, Bill Clinton, 
So she was a first lady. She would have been the first first lady that became a president, but she didn't win. Michelle Obama fought against childhood obesity. Someday there will be a female president. If she's married, there will be a first gentleman. Like the first ladies before him, he will carve out his own role. Does the president get paid? Yes, George Washington, our first president, received a salary of $25,000 a year. That may seem, not, not, not seem like much money, but remember that a dollar went a lot farther in 1789. In fact, it has been said that George Washington threw one across the Delaware River. That was a bad joke. Sorry, a little presidential humor. In 1873, the presidential salary was doubled to 50,000. Then it was increased to 75,000 in 1909, 100,000 in 1949, 200,000 in 1969, and now it's 400,000 for the president. The president does not have to pay for his house, his office staff, postage, electricity, or telephone service. He does have to pay for his own personal expenses, such as food, parties, and receptions that are not related to government business. In the late 1920s, baseball star Babe Ruth was earning the then enormous salary of $80,000. A newspaper reporter asked Ruth if he deserved to be making more than President Hoover. Sure, Ruth replied, I had a better year than he did. And that just happened to be the year that the stock market crashed and brought on the Great Depression. The Constitution says the president shall at stated times receive for his services a compensation, which shall neither be increased nor diminished during the period for which he shall have been elected. In other words, they can't get in there. Uh, a president can't become president and say, I want $10 million a day. Where does the president live? The president lives and works in the White House in Washington, DC. The street address is 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The White House was designed by James Hoban in 1792 and was built by while George Washington was in office. He was our only president who did not live in the White House. It wasn't finished. Over the years, the mansion has gone through a lot of changes. The British almost totally burned it down in 1814 because as much as we won the War of Independence, we had another war with Britain in 18, uh, the War of 1812, which went on for a couple years. Today, the White House has 132 rooms. In addition to the Oval Office, where the president works, and the president's living quarters, the White House has a barber shop, a doctor's office, dental clinic, tailor shop, beauty salon, machine shop, plumbing shop, gym, tennis court, basketball court, and a bowling alley. Nixon once bowled a score of 233. Heated pool, game room, and even a movie theater. <clears throat> now you might think, well, that's pretty cool. <clears throat> and yes, it, it is pretty cool. But remember, you don't want your president out gallivanting around the town because the Secret Service would have to go around with him constantly. And it always creates a hubbub when the president shows up and makes pro traffic problems. So they built everything into the White House that a person would need. The White House is so big, it has 32 toilets. Close to 100 people work in the White House. Every piece of furniture gets polished daily. Before 9-11, the White House was open to the public for tours of the first floor. Now it is necessary to get special permission from your senator or representative to take the tour. Why has there been just one African-American president and not a single female president? <clears throat> well, in a word, bigotry, which is not a pleasant word. It means that you judge people for either the color of their skin or their gender, male and female. Women were not even allowed to vote until 1920. Up until the 1960s, in some parts of our country, African-Americans had to attend separate schools, eat in separate restaurants, sleep in separate hotels, use separate bathrooms, and even drink from separate water fountains. Under such conditions, a black or female president in the United States would have been unthinkable. But that didn't stop their efforts. As far back as 1872, a woman named Victoria Woodhull ran for president representing the Equal Rights Party. Her vice presidential running mate was a black man, freed slave and famous speaker, Frederick Douglass. In more recent years, Shirley Chisholm, who was black and female, made a serious run for the Democratic nomination in 1972. In 1984, Democratic Geraldine Ferraro of New York was the vice presidential running mate of Walter Mondale. They lost the election. Elizabeth Dole ran for the Republican nomination in 1999. Prior to 2008, the most serious attempt by an African-American was by the Reverend Jesse Jackson, who attracted a lot of support in 1984 and 1988. Attitudes towards women and minority groups have changed dramatically over the last 40 years, 
They now serve as mayors, governors, senators, and representatives all over the country. Thank goodness. The country grew up into the idea that all people are created equal. What a revolutionary thought. Today, most Americans cast their vote for the person they think will do the best job, not the person of a certain gender or skin color. In 2008, African-American candidate Barack Obama was elected president. It is only a matter of time until the United States has a female president. And remember, one of our uh, candidates chose a female, Kamala Harris, to be his vice presidential uh, nominee. And if they win, she will be the first um, female vice president. Has there ever been a president who wasn't elected to the office? One time, it was Gerald Ford, the 38th president. Here's how it happened. In 1973, Vice President Spiro Agnew was accused of failing to pay his taxes when he was the governor of Maryland. Yeah, pretty silly, but it was true. <laughs> he resigned, mostly out of embarrassment. Richard Nixon, and Richard Nixon said, man, I don't need you on my ticket anymore. Get out of here. Who was president at the time appointed Gerald Ford to take Agnew's place as vice president. As it turned out, the following year, President Nixon resigned. It was not a very good term for President Nixon. And Vice President Ford became the first president who was never elected. Now, he ran for president in 76, but lost to Jimmy Carter. What about Lyndon Johnson? Didn't he just get to be president because President Kennedy was assassinated? Well, yes, but he had been elected vice president already with Kennedy. How long does a president stay in office? The king of a country will very often stay in power until he decides to step down, is overthrown, or dies. In the United States, the president holds office for a specific period of time. As it says in the Constitution, he shall hold his office during the term of four years. When George Washington's first four-year term was over, he ran for re-election and won a second term. Many people wanted Washington to run for a third term, but he refused. After that, it became tradition for the president to serve a maximum of two terms. But in 1940, much of the world was engulfed in war, and America was in the midst of a Great Depression. President Franklin Roosevelt was urged to run for a third term of office and won. He was our only president to serve more than two terms. Four years later, with the fighting now fighting in World War II, Roosevelt ran for a fourth term, and he won again. But he died before that term was over. Roosevelt was president for 12 years, the longest of any other president. Many people felt that four terms of office were too many. So in 1951, the 22nd Amendment to the Constitution was passed stating, no person shall be elected to the office of president more than twice. For more information, for your information, senators are elected to six-year terms and members of the House of Representatives are elected to just two-year terms. Why is the president's term of office four years? When the founding fathers wrote the constitution, they argued quite a bit about how long the president's term should be. First, they decided it's six years. Then they changed their mind and decided it should be 11. Then it was 15, then it was seven. Finally, they agreed on four. Four years gives the president enough time to get used to the job and get good work accomplished. It is not so long that a poor president could do much damage to the nation. Abraham Lincoln once said, no administration by any extreme wickedness of folly can very seriously injure the government in the sport, short space of four years. Does the president always run for a second term of office? No. James Polk, Rutherford Hayes, and Lyndon Johnson chose not to run for a second term. Johnson became president when John F. Kennedy was assassinated in 1963. He ran for re-election the following year and won. But Johnson received so much criticism for the way he was handling the war in Vietnam they announced in March of 68 that he would not pursue another term of office. Not every president has enjoyed being president. When his term of office was over and he was leaving the White House, President Taft said, I am glad to be going. This is the lonesomest place in the world. Lonesome because it's lonely at the top. When you're at the top, you have to make all the decisions and trust your own brain constantly. And you really can't depend on a lot of people, a small group of people people will try to give you bad advice to make you look bad. Has anyone ever been president two separate times once? Grover Cleveland was both the 22nd president and the 24th president. A Democrat, he won the 1884 election, but he lost when he ran for re-election in 1888. As he and his wife were moving out of the White House, Mrs. Cleveland told the staff to keep everything just the way it was us because she expected to move back after four years. As it turned out, 
She was right. Gerber Kleinman was nominated by the Democrats again in 1892 and won. What is a lame duck president? What does that mean? A president who's coming to the end of his second term of office is called a lame duck. He can't run for re-election. He can't get much accomplished because he won't be around very long as the nation's leader. In other words, he is not a very effective president. Some say the term lame duck was originally British. Others says it comes from hunting. A wounded duck, after all, does not make a very good trophy, and it certainly does not make a very good duck either. What does the president do after his term is over? Many of our presidents have retired to a life of leisure, Washington, Madison, Monroe, Eisenhower, or to write their autobiography, others remain very active. Thomas Jefferson helped start the University of Virginia. Herbert Hoover became the head of the Famine Emergency Commission. Benjamin Harrison practiced law. William Taft was appointed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. What? Yes, he's the only person that was at the top of the executive branch and then at the top of the judicial branch. The only one, William Howard Taft. And by the way, William Howard Taft was huge. He was so big when he was president, they had to build a special bathtub. Ulysses S. Grant toured the world. Theodore Roosevelt went to South America and toured the Explorer River. Jimmy Carter helped rival nations resolve their differences and helped renovate homes for the poor with the Organization of Habitat for Humanity. Two of our presidents ran for office after their presidency was over. Andrew Johnson was elected senator from Tennessee. John Quincy Adams was elected to Congress by the voters of Massachusetts. Some people felt it was a disgrace that the former president of the United States would lower himself to become a congressman, but Adams proudly stated that no man is disgraced by serving his country. What a great answer. He spent 17 years in Congress and helped establish the Smithsonian Institution. What a big success for him. President Barack Obama was the 44th president of the United States. Turn to the back of this book if you'd like, and we'll look at it later. The political party, term of office, date, and place of their death. Uh, we'll take care of that later. Why do people seem to always criticize the president? Listen, folks. People in charge get criticized because they're in charge and everybody has an opinion about the job that they're doing. So you have to, if you want to be in charge, if you want to be a leader, you have to have a thick skin and not be bothered by insults or people that criticize you constantly. It might still hurt, but you can't show it. He criticized me. That would look terrible for a president going on TV. <laughs> picking on me, you would think, oh, what kind of leader is this? We all have different kinds of people in this country, rich and poor, old and young, people of different ancestry, people of different racial groups, religions, and political parties. Many of these groups have differing opinions, interests, and desires. In some other countries, citizens are not allowed to express these opinions. In 1989, a large group of young people gathered in China to criticize the way the government was run. Government soldiers arrested them, imprisoned them, and in some cases, shot them. Mm. In America, we have freedom of speech, the freedom to express ourselves and our beliefs. We can think and say what we want about the government, even if the government doesn't like it. It is perhaps the most important right granted in the Bill of Rights. And I think one, two, I think we'll stop there and pick up the rest of chapter one on Tuesday. Now again, this uh, this book is you know longer than the other ones, but we're taking our time with it, and we will work through it all the way to um, week the end of week number two of the second quarter. Talk with you soon.